Hello. My name's Rowan. Uh, I'm a developer advocate at Google, and I have a slight confession. I made way too many slides, more than we can fit in half an hour. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through this very quickly, because I'm excited about it, and you can play it back at half speed on the live stream later. <laughs> OK. But before we jump in, um, I wanted to roll a brief pre-roll interstitial ad for you. If you have an in real life ad blocker, you may just see a black screen here. But I'm pre presenting from my Chromebook, which I didn't actually have a USB-C clicker for, so I wrote a little extension to map my switch controller to the browser. So come talk to me about that afterwards. OK, now into the talk then. People want to connect. They want to connect with each other. They want to connect with businesses. They want to connect with their little pets. Uh, or perhaps they want to connect to something larger than themselves. And how do we go about doing that, especially in today's world? Well, for the majority of us, we go about it like this. We connect through our mobile phones. I thought I would do, what do we call that now? A mashup? A remix? <laughs> anyway, the way we normally structure this is like this. We have a back end, we have a front end, and this is, you can tell this is an enterprise diagram because I have a cloud here. <laughs> but as with most good enterprise architecture diagrams, this does not really map to reality. What we actually have is something like this. I've been fairly good today in that I think I only have four internet connected devices on me. Um, does anyone just have one internet connected device with them? Just one. Wow, OK. You Come tell me about work-life balance afterwards, because I, I need some help on that one. But it's not just the devices, either. You've got to develop for several platforms, so you probably need to take care of Android, iOS, and web. Uh, and maybe it's not just web these days. Maybe we need to look at some other things. Uh, or maybe we care about wearables, so we've got to cover Android Wear, and we've got to cover Apple Watch. Um, and actually, we're getting into the assistive age now, so you also need to think about voice actions. Uh, you should probably cover our social email, your desktop app. China's getting really big now, so maybe you want to think about those. Uh, and in the next talk, we're also going to find out what we should be doing about virtual reality and augmented reality. <sighs> OK, this isn't focusing on the user. This is taking a kind of technology fetish approach to how we develop these things. And I don't advise that. A brief warning, there is a car analogy coming up. So if, if that's going to be a problem, look away now. But first of all, I'll just throw this out there. Apps and sites are dead. I'm not going to explain it. I'm not going to back it up. <laughs> I'm just going to move on. <laughs> so this is uh, the first car I ever drove, a 1984 Triumph Acclaim CD. And by drive, I mean a friend had it behind a barn, and we drove it into a ditch. But what I want to kind of cover off of this is there's something important here, and it's this thing, OK? So I just need to enhance that. OK, who knows what that is? A choke, yeah, OK. That, that was very few hands that went up. <laughs> so as an explanation here, um, before engines were fuel injected, you had to use the choke. And what the choke did was it adjusted the uh, fuel-air ratio to the engine, because a cold engine needs more fuel in it to actually start. And the reason it looks like this is because when you pull that thing out, you're actually adjusting a valve that adjusts the air pressure. Now, the thing is, this is a huge amount of information that we were pushing on users, who all they wanted to do was get from A to B, right? But instead, we're suddenly teaching them that it's kind of like, oh, you can't just turn the key. You need to take the choke out, then turn the key, probably pump the accelerator a bit. Anyway, my point is, apps and sites are maybe not dead, but as far as users are concerned, these are implementation details. We've taught people about going to an app store. We've taught people about typing in a URL or following a link. We've tried to teach people what that little padlock icon means at the top of their browser and whether that should be important to them or not. But maybe that's the wrong thing. Maybe we shouldn't be focusing on teaching people all of this technological stuff when what they want to do is order a coffee or speak with their friend. I, I sort of fall into the camp of believing that there aren't any new ideas in computer science. We just kind of recycle the same ones every 10 years when we can like, trade up things to get better consultancy rates. And what I'm seeing is a kind of move from this like, app-centric idea back to task-centric idea. 
So what I want to share with you over the course of this talk and the remaining, <laughs> oh, wow, I'm actually like only one minute into my slot. <laughs> okay. I want to share some ways that you can think about taking a more task-centered approach to creating web apps or creating Android apps and where you can learn from each of those worlds. And I wanted to do this by shamelessly stealing some slides from our marketing team because they came up with, one, they came up with a Venn diagram which fit the title of my talk, so I was kind of like, well, that's going in. Um, but I do feel like it actually sums up things fairly nicely. So when users are out and about trying to do something, they have an intent. So that's the kind of like, I want lunch, I want to speak to my friend, I want to get to the museum. And they have a context. And that context is not just, you know, where they are and what they're feeling, it's things like what's their network connectivity, what device do they have on them, what are they doing at the moment, is their attention somewhere else, are they driving, are they walking? And then there's the immediacy. And the immediacy is, given those two things, what I want to do and my context for it, can I actually achieve it right now? Are you giving me the tools that I need to make that happen? And that is called, and this is where you maybe see that I took it from the sales team, that is what we call a micro moment. <laughs> okay. But micro moments, and the point about this, is they have these fragmented user journeys. So 90% of people are using multiple screens for everyday activities. If you're booking a trip or you're planning, uh, you're planning an event, you're probably going across your phone and your laptop and your tablet, or maybe you're watching Netflix and you've got it going on your TV. And as well, when we're talking about e-commerce, it's not just going between devices. People are looking at their device and planning something before they go into a physical shop. And, of course, there's also the contextual side of that as well. When they're in the store, they're also still looking at their device. I know on a regular basis, I will look at something and then I'll look it up on Amazon to see if it's cheaper, if I can... Anyway, some of the things... Now, this is an example of if you can cater for those use cases, right? If I can go into the shop and I know I can go to your website and it will actually be sensible enough to know that I'm in the store and maybe there's like a different experience you want to present to me, that's a good moment. But I have experienced things like this a little too often. So first of all, I want to watch a video, but it's some premium content video and like a good web user, I want to pay a creator for what they've done rather than just finding an alternative download source. Um, so I want to sign up to pay for it. So first thing I have to do is I have to be taught about this going through an account registration process. Um, so I log up and I sign in. And when I do that, you tell me that I know you came to the web, <laughs> but actually we're better at apps. So maybe you could download our app or maybe that's a metric we need to drive. So we're trying to push app downloads. So I do that. I download the app. When I get into the app, you've just spent a lot of money on your onboarding video, and it's three minutes long, and you really want to make sure a lot of people see it, so I sit through that. Then you've forgotten that I was actually signed in before, so I've got to sign in again there, uh, and by this point, I've forgotten what I was trying to do, what video I was trying to find, and maybe I just hop onto some other kind of site where I can get this sort of stuff for free. Okay, but that's enough complaining. Let's see what kind of things I think we could do differently to fix this. If this is what you're building, our, our enterprise diagram, this is what I actually want to feel. I just want to feel like I'm connecting to another person to get something done. Now, on the web, we have a handy way of doing this, which is URLs. I was thinking to myself, a URL is this human-readable identifier that allows the loading of data and code needed for that particular resource. Of course, if you've been looking around uh, at the news recently, then whether this is really human-readable is up for debate. But developer-readable, I guess? There's a sort of, there's a Venn diagram with developers and humans, I think. <laughs> um, so first, look up in the sky. It's a website. Uh, well, I'm, okay, yeah, we'll skip that, because that's literally the point of the web, right? It's you hit a URL, and there's a page or a resource on the other side of it. But what if it was something else? And what if on the end of the URL is a C library? Or well, not quite that. This is where WebAssembly comes in. Uh, who, has, who knows what WebAssembly is? Okay, reasonable. So WebAssembly is a binary format that basically allows sort of like compiled code to run client-side in your browser. And this enables a number of interesting things. So for example, you could go here and start this loading up in your browser. And in case you are getting a little bored during the talk, this will work on your phone as well, just as a hint. 
and you can start to do something like this, like run actual Windows 2000 in your browser. And why is this important? Because if you can do this, you can do incredibly valuable work. <laughs> now, I think at this point you may be thinking, OK, this is an interesting tech demo, but what does this have to do with real life? And haven't we seen this before with like Flash applets and Java applets? And in fact, just installing native apps where you point me to a big binary blob on the end of the URL. That doesn't really feel like the web. So something I'm a bit more excited about, though, is this kind of thing. So Surma on my team over in the London office uh, has written a little blog or article here where he's gone through the process of wrapping a, an existing C library uh, through Mscripten so that he can expose it to a page. And what he's been trying to do here is make use of the WebP image encoding library so that he can do that image encoding in the browser. And it looks a bit like this. So the first thing that you have to do is you write a bit of C code that just wraps the methods from the library that you want to expose. So you can see here we're exposing the create buffer and destroy buffer, and we're also exposing the encode method to, unsurprisingly, do some encoding. Then you run it through the compiler here. So I'm really only just showing you this as a sort of indication of the steps involved rather than expecting you to understand any of this. A nice little bit from this article is Surma pointed out that at that end bit where he's feeding it the C files, he wasn't really too sure which files it needed, so he just fed it everything. And the compiler is actually pretty good at optimizing that down to just what's being used. Once you've got that, you'll get your little binary file available for you. And here, we can actually see the JavaScript where we're making use of it in the page. So this is just your standard client-side JavaScript where you've included the WASM in. You can see we're making that encode call there. We're getting the result pointer. We're basically spitting the result out into a blob. And then here, you can see that we're, or sorry, now we're taking that result and we're putting it into a blob, which we're specifying as WebP, and then we're just attaching it to an image source element, resulting in something beautiful like this. And if you go along to here as well, you can actually take a look through the resources that are being loaded. Now, in this particular example, the WASM file that results is fairly chunky because Summer has actually put a whole bunch of other things into it. But if you compile it down to just the things that you need, you can actually get a pretty lightweight binary that comes out of it. And the point of this is that suddenly you sort of have these client-side microservices that you can run reliably in any environment. So with things like this, you're not dependent on the browser's underlying implementation, which may differ from platform to platform, but you have a guaranteed environment in which to run a particular piece of code. OK. Next bit then, we look up, and this time, it's an Android app. Now, I just wanted to take, in fact, who's done Android development as well? OK, OK, good, because I was, Sometimes I put stuff in that I think is really advanced and everyone's like, no, this is old news to us. Or sometimes I put things in that I think are really basic and people look at me with this confused face. Uh, if you look at me with a confused face, I will slow down. Uh, no, I won't. We're running out of time. I'll just go fast anyway. So deep links first. On the Android side, a deep link means that if I have the app installed, and the app has said it is able to handle certain URLs, then Android can optionally push you to the app rather than the URL. I kind of like this because this is actually just kind of like saying my app is a specialized browser for this type of URL. And this, unsurprisingly, inside of Android is handled with a bunch of XML. Uh, you don't really need to understand what's going on here again, just to kind of point out that in the manifest for the app, this is where you're defining the URLs that you are capable of handling. And they don't need to be URLs that you own as well. CityMapper does this interesting thing where they can actually intercept Google Maps URLs so if someone sends me a Maps link, I can actually open it in CityMapper to get directions there. OK, that's not super interesting. What gets a bit more interesting is if we talk about app links. So app links are kind of the same thing. It's a deep link. But instead, what you've done is you've actually verified that you own that domain and that that app is associated with this domain. So this goes in the um, assets links file, the uh, JSON file that sits on your website. If you have an app and you haven't done something like this already, I would strongly recommend looking at it because there's also a little smart lock thing that I'm more than happy to waffle on about later, um, but is well worth your time. So in this instance, we've now said that this app and this site are definitely associated with each other. And I just wanted to jump back to my definition then of a URL, 
where it's kind of like, oh, it's a human readable identifier to allow the loading of data and code needed for that resource. And as web developers, we're generally used to the sort of architectural structure of saying, oh, whenever this request comes in, I'm going to push back all of the resources needed to load that particular um, resource, page, app, whatever it is you've put on the end of the URL. Now, interestingly enough, we've started hearing this kind of thing from Android developers as well. So with Google Play Instant, the Instant apps, what's happening here is when you hit a URL that has a app associated with it that is capable of being delivered as an Instant app, then optionally, Android will kick in and it will deliver just enough of the app to actually run for you. So an example here from Anna, who uh, actually works for the Deliveroo Android team here in London. She has this app called Paper Football, which is a neat kind of little like pen and paper based thing where you're sort of following grid squares to try and play football. I, that was, I, I am not a football person, so I sort of got that you want to get the blob in the other goal, but that's not the point of this talk. This, which you can actually go along to that URL there, and if you have instant apps enabled, then you should see some kind of instant app experience. I kind of wanted to share it with you here, but given that I'm actually a Google person, that means my phone is never really working properly, so I couldn't get this to load. But <laughs> I'm assured it's a lovely experience. And what tends to happen is once you're inside of there, you're using this partial bit of the app. And one of the patterns that I'm intrigued to see how this plays out is from there, you can actually upgrade to the full app experience. So one of the business problems that people ran into of trying to get app conversions is actually a bit delayed now, and the installation is actually going on in the background. But that's kind of like, that's a place where Android is playing catch up with the web, because we can already do that. So what's a place where we're looking at things that Android is doing? When you go beyond just having this ephemeral app and you actually want to repeatedly use something, you're going to add it to your home screen. Android recently introduced this thing called App Shortcuts. And what that means is on newer versions of Android, if you long press on your app, you might actually get a few of these additional shortcuts out of there. And on this side, these can either be, unsurprisingly, configured through more XML. But these are the static versions. So these aren't that interesting. That might be, if it's a Facebook app, maybe it's like my profile, my friend's feed, a bunch of standard top-level headings. What's more interesting is that you can actually add these dynamically. So for example, if you have WhatsApp on your phone and you long press on that, you should see app shortcuts for your most contacted people. Now, again, this is one of those areas where it's kind of like, well, the web can do this because we have URLs and you can bookmark a URL. But what we're missing at the moment is a UI that provides that more kind of intelligent bookmark manager, like the site actually suggesting to you what should the top level add to home screen things be. I think there's a way of playing with this that you can take a look at. And I want to double check how speedy I have to be. Oh. OK. Who has played with add to home screen before? Yeah? Who, who has like apps regularly added to their home screen that they use on like, a daily basis? OK, cool, cool. Right, so the thing about Add to Home Screen, though, is it's Chrome without the Chrome. Oh, my god. OK. <laughs> but the point that I'm trying to make here is that by just doing Add to Home Screen, you can actually create a bad experience for your user. Because if you haven't put the consideration in for what happens once you take away all of that browser navigation, you may be doing something wrong. And even though Add to Home Screen is very easy to implement, it's harder to create a good experience with it. And if you just do that for your top level site, this may leave like a poor taste in your mouth afterwards for trying to do any of these features in the future. So what I want you to try and think about is creating these discrete, non-invasive, and measurable use cases that you can use on an incremental way to see if something like Add to Home Screen is going to work for you. So in this case, I want you to consider something like if I'm trying to order a sofa, I probably don't want to add the top page of your site back to my home screen because I'm not someone who buys sofas on a daily basis. But when I've ordered the perfect sofa from you, it's going to take a couple weeks for you to construct it. So I probably am going to want to come back to track that order. So what I would like to do is add that order to my home screen and keep an eye on that. And so the way you do this 
is the manifest that you're exposing is just a resource on your server like any other. That means you can respond with dynamic content there. So in this instance, I've just done something where I'm under order slash one, two, three, four, five, and I've got a manifest under that. In this case, it's kind of a static file for that order, but the point is I've sectioned it off. And when I talked about measurement before as well, you want to look for these event listeners, because as well, with something like this, you probably don't want the browser to automatically prompt me to just add something to my home screen if I'm in the middle of a conversion flow. Instead, you want to allow me to do that based on a user action. And inside of here is where you're listening for that prompt and responding to it if you've put some kind of element on the screen to say, add to home screen. And I was playing around, I'm not very good at hashtags, so this is an infeasibly long one, but my feeling here is that this goes, beyond, this goes beyond just adding the main site to your home screen, but you start building these kind of single serving sites where it's just, I have my sofa, and that's gonna exist on my home screen for the lifetime of that order. Okay, and where can you measure that? So I just wanted to point out, I showed you the um, deferred prompt that I'd captured before when the user actually clicks on, yes, I want to add to home screen. And inside of here, you can actually get the user choice. So you can see if they dismissed the prompt or if they chose to install it. And here, I'm just using Google Analytics, but obviously whatever analytics provider or method you want to use for tracking, did they install it, did they not, you pop it in here. Then. On the other side, inside of your manifest, you'll also probably want to add some kind of tracking on the start URL as well, because you want to understand how many times people are launching that app from their home screen. So you can see here, again, unsurprisingly, I've just used Google Analytics here, but you can pop whatever get parameters you want on the end, because again, it's just a URL. Oh, yes, good thing I highlighted that, because that is important. One of the things about this is you want to ensure that these single serving sites are non-invasive. That means you use the scope parameter to say, I only want the add to home screen experience to kick in if I'm under this particular section of the site. That means you can put the UI and UX work into making sure that that subsection of your site behaves well without any Chrome around it. And then when the user leaves that, they actually just jump back into the browser to browse the rest of your site as a website. Okay, next up then, when the user is actually inside of the app, if they're using it in add to home screen mode, you can actually make use of the display mode media query here to see if they are in standalone mode. So this starts to give you an understanding of are people using it in the browser or are they using it in the add to home screen experience? Now, onto the kind of final role of this. Who loves notifications on the web? <laughs> One person. <laughs> Thanks, I will give you your five pounds later. Uh, now, I think this is not a problem inherent in the technology. I think it's good that we're making the web a more capable platform. However, it means that we've given people a lot of power and they've gone out and started shooting themselves in the foot and started shooting other people in the feet and that's not really a look that we're after. So I want to use this Venn diagram to show you what I think encompasses a good notification. If you are sending a notification from your website, it should be personal and relevant. That notification should be meaningful for me, not meaningful for someone else. If a sale is starting, that's not a reason to send a notification. But if a watched item that I care about has just come into stock, that is a reason to send a notification. And it should be precise and complete as well, right? The best notifications are the ones that I don't actually need to tap because they tell me everything that I need in that snippet there. And finally, it should be timely. You can, or you can set an expiry on notifications. So if it is something like a flash sale or it's my taxi arriving, once that time has passed, you can expire that notification and it's not there taking up my notification shade, adding enough things across the top that it looks like I just have a solid bar there. Do all of that and I feel like we could create notifications that people love rather than notifications that mean people just disable it for the platform as a whole. And I felt it looked something like this. So if I'm tracking my sofa, I've got something that's personal to me. You can't deliver that same sofa to multiple locations, or if you do, I'm going to be unhappy. It's timely because it's telling me that it's going to be here in five minutes, and it's complete as well. Because if I'm all ready, I don't have to do anything with this notification, but I can take some helpful actions. 
And going back to our little property here, what does that look like? This is the data that gets pushed in the push message, the push message to your service worker. So you can see that I've got the action in there, I've got some targets, and basically, in here, when you receive that push notification, you are showing the notification. That's where you would add the analytics if you want to know that the notification has been displayed. And then, the matching part of that is you're also listening for interactions with the notification. And inside of here, you can see I'm pulling out the action, and I'm opening a window in response to that. You don't have to open the window. You can do something else if you want. OK. And finally, then, on notifications, ask for permission in context, right? Do not, as uh, in fact, when I was looking for a new site to look up something about notifications, I landed, and the first thing it did was ask me if it could send me push notifications, which obviously got the block response. Do it in context so that I know what's going on, because you're not spammers. No? Good. I view you as kind of stewards and pioneers in the ecosystem. So what I want is you to go out there and create these good, meaningful experiences with notifications so that we can try and roll back some of the damage to the, and perception that we've got there already. OK. How are we doing? Nice. Notifications aren't needed in every single example, though. We can also do some slightly uh, less invasive things. Um, if you have a recent version of Chrome, this is the Twitter PWA where I have some notifications, and you can see that it's actually badged slightly to indicate that there are some active notifications. I needed a screenshot in the hurry, so shout out to James, because the first thing I did was just tweet, test tweet, don't interact. 35 seconds later, he had interacted with it. So thank you, James, for just being contrary in your nature. Now, what we've actually got coming is um, Miguel has proposed this badging API. Uh, so you can go along to the GitHub uh, repo and take a look there. Also, if you're just generally interested in getting involved in standards development, this is kind of a good place to do it, because this is very early on, and it's quite a simple API, and the people responding are quite friendly. So if you have opinions or thoughts or just want to see the process in action, this is a good place to do it. But you can see what he's suggesting is adding a badge object, which would be available on Windows and Workers. And it just has a set and a clear method where you can set something like uh, this. Let's assume this is a messaging application. We've got our unread messages. We're setting it in the badge. And that will appear as a little number on our badge. And you're not just limited to numbers. You can also put emoji in there. So the other thing you could do is, let's say it's a flight tracking app, and your flight is now ready for boarding. You could add a boarding badge there. Or let's say that you, are, you have some kind of image sharing app, and people are sharing lots of images of pictures of their children, which you're not super interested in, but you are interested if they start sharing pictures of cats. So you have a little badge that tells you when there's a new cat picture available. OK. That's early days. Um, that's not ready yet. It's just out there to sort of play with and look at. So what should you build right now? What am I going to suggest? Given this audience, I might suggest that we should just all be building websites, which we should. But how are we going to build those websites? I'm not going to answer this question. I'm just going to give you more possibilities and send you away more confused. So to wrap up, I wanted to take a look at this. Um, in the Android world, they have been sort of switching from Java to Kotlin. And Kotlin is basically uh, like Java, but imagine you just took out all of the unnecessary boilerplate and had like a slimline language instead. So Wojtek has uh, this repo here, where he's written a little Sudoku solver for Android. Uh, it also runs as an instant app. So it just displays the board, and then you've got a solve button, and you can go from there. However, what's interesting is that he also has this um, hosted on the web. And if you go take a look at what's being downloaded here, this is a little bit heavy, because it's downloading the Kotlin, uh, Kotlin JS runtime. Because you can cross-compile or transpile your Kotlin code to JavaScript. And what he's done is actually built out a, so all of this is shared Kotlin code, the same Sudoku engine, uh, the random number generator, this is all exactly the same Kotlin code that is running the Android app as well. The only bit that he had to do that was specific was writing a little renderer 
um, plugin where it's actually pulling in the DOM elements to do the rendering. So if you include, this is the Kotlin code that's doing it. Um, what you can see is that in Kotlin, you actually have access to like the canvas rendering context, the HTML canvas element, and you can just use those. And if you look down here, it's like this starts to look suspiciously like JavaScript. So you can just compile that out, and you can have that same code base that is powering both your Android app and your web app. Whew. OK. So that's what I want. I want you to go out of here feeling like you're thinking a bit more about how are you going to create apps and sites that are going to get people to connect to the thing they want to do, rather than it just being a way of using every single new technology that's available to you at the moment. Slides are available over here. I'm available on Twitter here. And I will be around for questions and trivia and anything else later on. Thank you. <laughs>